This is the Castrol Day of the Champions. And if you're not here, then I really don't know what you're doing. You obviously don't like bikes that much. <laughs> Luckily for you, we are here, and we're going to show you the sights and the sounds of the best day of classic racing you'll see in South Africa. With constant on-track action, there's something for everyone. And in the pits, you can get as close to the bikes and the riders as you could possibly want. OK, Dennis, I've actually got a challenge for you. There's a lot of very famous people here with a lot of impressive statistics behind yeah. them. I want you to find the man with the most world championships. All right, I've got something for you. All right, then. How about you find the man with the most TT wins? All right. It's on. It's a deal. <laughs> well, my challenge from Harry was to find the man with the most world championships. And I just happened to stumble across the legendary Jim Redmond. How many championships have you won exactly? Yeah, six world championships and six Isle of Man TTs, which is almost the same as a world championship. The big thing is to get picked for a works team, and I was the first guy, uh, one of the first three into the Fonda team. After me came Mark Howard, he got five, Duan got five, Rossi got three, and he went to Yamaha. So it leaves me with the six, and Casey Stone has just won and retired, so I've got another six years on, at the top, as it is. You know. And you've got quite a, a relationship with Nicky Hayden. Tell us well, a bit Nikki about and that. I go back to 04, I went to um, uh, Spain and met Nicky for the first time and we sort of said hello and I said, you know, you're the only guy that can take the championship away from Rossi. And I said, you won't do it next year, but if you make a plan for next year, you'll be world champion the following year. But then I said, I'm an old fart, what do I know? He said, let's go and have coffee. And I mapped out what I thought and he carried it out. What do events like this mean to you? I mean, you guys are still racing, you're still out here, still doing your thing. What does it mean to you to be actually participate in events like this? I was just talking about that, and I do about the same number. I do about 25 of these a year, and I used to do about 35 on my career. But the difference is we have so much fun, and uh, we haven't got that pressure of the bike's got to be spot on, and you've got to win, and all the rest of it. Now the bike misfires a bit, so watch, just slow down a bit, you know. So we have so much fun and uh, I'm really enjoying myself. OK, so my challenge was to find the man, the rider, with the most TT wins, and I've found him. It is, of course, the legendary Mr Mick Grant. Uh, Mick, very nice to have you here. How many TT wins exactly? About seven. Now, of course, you were still racing in 78 and 79 when Mike Hellwood made his comeback. Yes. Now, what were your feelings about him? I mean, he'd been off racing for 11 years. What were your feelings about him coming back? Obviously, you were stoked to be racing against the legend, but deep yes. down? Well, I, I actually told him he shouldn't do it because the risk was just tremendous. Um, but in actual fact, he, he, he equipped himself very well. And in actual fact, halfway through the practice week, he was like about three miles an hour off the pace. And he said, would I take him around for a lap? And it was like God asking me to, to tell him how to understand the Bible. I mean, I felt very humble. And we did a lap together. And um, at the end of it, I followed him for half a lap. And then he, he followed me. And all he was doing wrong is that when he last raced a bike in the 60s, the drum brakes. Now with more powerful disc brakes, he wasn't braking hard enough. So I said, all he's doing wrong, his lines were right, his speed was right just breaking too soon and I just told him that and I should have kept my mouth shut because he was on the pace the next practice. Now of course you're here in South Africa, um, we talked about you said now it's just about making a living, is this, is being here all about the money or is this something that draws you here every year? I've never come over here for the money, we, we, I came the first time in 1973 and I've been coming ever since, I just love, I love the country, I love the people, uh, we, just, we just get locked after so well it's just fantastic. It's not just uh, international stars of the track which are here today, there's also a lot of local races. Now, a good example of that is Mr. Mike Cox here. Now, by day, he's a mild-mannered businessman, and then in evenings and weekends, he puts on his greasy leathers and he goes racing. So, Mike, this isn't necessarily a, a rich man's sport, is it? No, it doesn't have to be. Um, you can buy a bike for 20,000 Rand, and you can come ride with us, and you can buy a bike like one of our members just did uh, for 450,000 Rand. And then are the different classes, is it a certain age cut-off uh, of the bikes I'm talking about, not the riders? <laughs> is it a certain age cut-off for the bikes? Yes, correct. Group A 
Um, it's got to have spoke wheels. It, the cutoff is December 1975, and it doesn't roll. And Group B starts from January 76 and ends at December 1983. Now, is there a, uh, an organising body which, or a club which you're all part of, which you have to be part of to be in this sort of racing category? Well, we, have a, we started a group in 2002 called Historic Motorcycle Group. We've now got about 120 members, uh, something like 140 bikes, and uh, we parade and practice every month. So there's no actual championship which you're racing for, it's just demonstration laps, which get a bit hairy every now and again, I'm sure. Well, uh, red mist is a problem, but yeah, there's no points, there's no trophies, we're not allowed to carry a transponder, and we're not allowed to win a prize. So it's all for the fun of the sport, more than anything else. Of course, this weekend isn't just about the riders, there's also some mouth-watering machinery. So let's have a quick look at a few pieces. It's hard to imagine that machines like this matchless G50 were once at the cutting edge of race bike design and could lap the Isle of Man at over 100 miles an hour, despite the skinny tyres, drum brakes and the basic suspension. By the late 50s, the Italians had shown the way with their multi-cylinder bikes and then the Japanese turned up with their two, three, four, five and six cylinder bikes and consigned the British singles to the history books. But the immortal Manx Norton still gave them a run for their money every now and again. Between 1947 and 1962, the Manx won countless races and was the mainstay of British racing. Anybody could buy one from the factory and enter a Grand Prix, the equivalent of buying Rossi's M1 Yamaha and turning up to a MotoGP today. What was revolutionary about this bike was its double loop frame that made the Manx the best handling bike of its day. It was nicknamed the Featherbed because it gave the rider such a smooth ride compared to its rivals. The Manx Norton remains the classic British racing bike, simple yet effective, and it still sounds brilliant. Have it. I met one of the most legendary motorcyclists in the world, Mr. Jim Redman. What about you? Yeah, and I fulfilled my task. I met Mick Grant, possibly one of my all-time heroes. And let's not forget that it's not just about these international stars, it's the local guys who make this kind of uh, event happen as well as it does. It happens every year, so you have to get yourself down here. 